right. Hello and welcome to Around the Horns, a show where we are talking everything Texas baseball, even though we are in the thick of March Madness right now. I am your host, Aaron. I am here, as always, with my co-host, Zach. Uh, We are recording this on Wednesday morning. We watched Texas win their sixth game in a row last night against North Dakota State. Zach, uh, the Horns have been home for a while. We've been around the park. Um, How are you feeling? How are you doing lately? Yeah, doing good. Um, I feel like some home cooking has been good for the Horns. They feel a little bit better defensively. They've had time to just, you know, get a lot of practice time in, feel a lot of feel a lot of fun go. So they they've looked more solid. But yeah, six game winning streak. We're going streaking. Yep, no nothing to complain about there. I mean, we'll get into the to the we'll pick some nits and talk about some big picture stuff here. But uh, let's hit on the weekend quickly. A big part of that six game win streak was, of course, the sweep over um, brother Jasper and his fellow Manhattan Jaspers. My big overall take from the weekend. Uh, I think I'm good on on watching Manhattan Jaspers play baseball for like a decade or a decade or so. How do you feel? Yeah, this was the first meeting between Texas and Manhattan, and I hope you know it. Maybe not the last, but um, yeah, I don't I don't see them getting an invite back anytime soon. So, yeah, I mean, we had a uh, we had Friday. I mean, the starter he he threw seven he threw seventeen straight balls. I mean, you just you just don't see that very often. My whole thing was. I've seen pitchers lose control of it, of course. Um, you know, I, I've spent my time. I've I've seen I've seen some pitchers lose control, but like when a pitcher is so wild, you don't know where the ball is going, and that's like the whole point. So when you don't know where the ball is going, you figure one is just going to land in the strike zone, just because probability, just like you're just going to happen to throw a strike just by accident. Um, yeah, that was incredible stuff. Yeah, I mean, I will unfortunately i will probably uh it will take me a long time to forget about the 17 straight balls that we saw on friday yeah um you know the law of averages say that at some point you're going to hit the the strike zone or the umpire is just going to feel bad and like give you like a oh there's a pity strike for you i mean most pitchers you get a 3-0 count they're just going to groove a fastball right down the middle he couldn't even do that it was it was something special to behold yeah something new every day. <laughs> yeah. No mercy, no mercy from the umpire at all, or from the Texas hitters that were just taking the walks left and right as they should. Um, Lucas Gordon really good on Friday. We'll touch on that quickly. Uh, he did not allow a hit through, I believe it was uh six innings, maybe six plus. They talked, we talked to him after the game. He said he does not know if he's ever thrown a no hitter before just in classic Lucas Gordon fashion. I mean, if I had even sniffed a no hitter of any kind, I would have, like the baseball plastered on the wall with a scorecard from the random like 13 U Saturday game. Um, not Lucas Gordon. He's probably thrown a couple. Doesn't even remember it, but I, uh, you know, he was back to his normal self after the rough start in Cali. Yeah. I mean, Cali cool as always. He was, he was jovial and joking and yeah, I don't, I'm not even sure he knew that he had not given up a hit. He was just like, Oh really? I, okay, sure. Why not? That's fun. I mean, just complete Lucas. Uh, but no, it was really good to see him get back on track. Um, you know, that was just, I think it was truly an aberration an off day. And, you know, he wasn't, uh, I would say like, he didn't have a perfect night. He still gave up a couple of walks, but he was, he was really solid. He commanded really well with his changeup, which allowed him to get into the fastball counts and then get in that slider, which he got a couple of strikeouts on. So yeah, it was good to see. Yeah. Dave Pierce talked about that after the game, you know, everyone's been talking about the new slider, rightfully. So that's a big pitch for him, but David Pierce did say, you know, the changeup is still his best pitch and we need to get that one going for him because that that's still kind of the, that's kind of his bread and butter there. So um, unfortunately the same could not be said for um, Zane Morehouse and Travis Staley. They both struggled a bit. Um, Morehouse was able to put up a decent stat line. I believe it went five innings, giving up two earns, but he just, a lot of loud, loud contacts, um, getting behind in counts, uh, just leaving a lot of pitches over the middle of the plate and, even against the Manhattan Jaspers, man, if you throw enough pitches down the middle of the plate, you know, those guys are by name D1 hitters, so they will hit it eventually. And then Travis Staley on Sunday, I mean, just cruising through four. It was like, you know, it was, it was one of the best outings we'd ever seen from him through four innings. He was just out there throwing strikes like he should against them. And then he really started to throw right down the middle of the plate. Um, and they got to him big time in the fourth and to begin the fifth inning there. So, yeah. Yeah, we've got quite the uh, pitching conundrum, which we are going to talk about here in a second um, as it comes to figuring out that weekend rotation as Texas gets closer to conference play here in a week or two against Texas Tech. But um, 
you know, what'd you see from Zane and Travis and then anything else that stood out to you um, throughout the weekend against Manhattan? Yeah. So Zane threw 71 pitches in three innings. He struck out five, but he also gave up two earned runs and five hits. So it wasn't a terrible outing. It was just the amount that he labored was really bad. I mean, he just wasn't commanding his, his breaking ball, but you would, it would show flashes, right? He'd get in a one, two count and he'd throw three straight balls. He'd get down 2-0, and then he'd come back with a really good breaking ball. So I think more for him, it was just consistency. Um, it's a little concerning because he wasn't super sharp out in Cali either. Um, you know, one of my big concerns about Morehouse is his ability to get out pitches and, you know, getting far too deep into counts, and that's definitely what we saw. And um, it is, it's something to look forward to this weekend, just to look and see how that translates. You know, does he need to tinker a little bit with his release or – was he just having, again, an off night? Because after Saturday night's game, David Pierce did state, look, the team's just tired. We've we've been on the road out to Cali. We've had a double midweek. We've been grinding. Um, and they, they did look a lot fresher and, like, sharper on Sunday, to your point. Like, Travis Daly came out and was just kind of dominating. He was, he was looking really, really good. But I don't know if it was he got tired or he just lost his release point, what it was. But, yeah, in the, in the fifth inning, it really kind of fell apart on him and – he ended up giving up five runs that that didn't well maybe not that inning but that uh that outing so yeah that's just kind of been the story with um Staley here early in his career he's just had some really good moments and he's had some struggles and you just never know when we're going to get the good when you're going to get the bad and it can it can flip in the middle of an outing you know without any warning whatsoever which is just always concerning you know if you're looking at it from a coach perspective and then trying to know when's the right time to push a guy or to pull a plug on a guy and when you have a guy that can lose it that quick or just get hot that quick, you just never know when the right time is going to be. So that's tough. Um, man, I mean, Charlie Hurley, good once again over the weekend. Peyton Powell continued to kill it. You know, the weekend in California was no fluke. Um, the Peyton Powell breakout is absolutely happening. He has now moved up into the two hole. I think that's a really good slot for him. He controls the bat really well. He can protect EK there. Um, he's handled lefties decently. So having EK and Powell there hitting one, two, even against all the lefties that Texas will face for the rest of time. Um, I think it's fine for the most part. So those are some other guys that really stood out, but Zach, I want to talk now, you can uh, add anything there if you want, but also uh, North Dakota state on Tuesday night. Yeah. So the only other thing I wanted to add was uh, Heston toll came in was absolute fire on Sunday. No Saturday. Uh, he went three innings, had seven strikeouts. He gave up three hits, but they were all soft. Nothing, you know, crazy. Uh, he looks really, really good. He came in to just kind of lock things down. Got to say his first career save at Texas. Um, the other person that I thought threw well was uh, Max Grubbs. He ended up getting the win. He only went an inning, but it's good to get him back as he kind of continues to come back from that knee injury. Um, and then on Sunday, it was Cody Howard, the other yeah, the Baylor transfer that looked really good. Again, he went two out, two innings, uh, but I thought he mixed his pitches up really well. He has really good shape on his fastball and his changeup, and so it was good to see some some newer arms get in there and kind of get some work. Yeah, Heston told man. I mean, during these games where Texas is up big and it's those later innings, and you know everyone just kind of is ready to get this game over with and let's get out of here with the win. I, I'm yeah. I mean, we're going to start calling him the press box hero because <laughs> yeah. he is the he is the epitome of the guy that will just come in throw like 10 straight sliders in the zone and the inning will be over in a matter of time. And that's just the time where everyone in the press box is just about ready to, you know, get stuff wrapped up, got post-game duties. You know, it's, it's time to, time to get on the road. And when, when you, when you need to get on the road and you need a game to end, uh, Heston told, you know, that's the guy you need. So. Yeah. It was, it was a sneaky seven strikeouts. Like I thought, you know, yes. three or so. And I look at the box score and I'm like, Holy crap. He had seven strikeouts. I mean, he was just in there just one after the other. He works really fast anyways. And, yeah, they had no idea what was coming with that slider. It was, he was just dropping him in there every single time. So it was fun to watch. Yeah, he's always fun to watch. Um, all right, let's get to Tuesday night. The victory over North Dakota State. Texas winning 7-2, extending extending the win streak to six games. LBJ, not, not what we were hoping to see. Um, you know, it had been interesting because he had had really linear progress, right? Like he started the year, oh, he looks better. Next outing, oh, man, he looks really good. Next out in career high, six innings, he's ready to start. And then, you know, in college baseball, a guy like that, you, you're you always hoping for that linear, nice and easy, you know, straightforward development. That's just not really how the game of baseball works. Like you're going to have some ups and downs. And um, 
you know, there was definitely a road bump last night against North Dakota State. LBJ, he just, David Pierce said he was just a little out of sync. That's exactly what it looked like to me. Um, just he was he was spiking that slider. He was spiking the fastball from time to time. He had like three wild pitches in the first two innings. Ended up only going uh, two and two thirds. He just a lot of pitches left over the middle of the plate. It was it was just twenty twenty two LBJ is all that it was. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, the next how he responds will be pretty telling. But um, you know, I don't have any big you know panics on LBJ. But I mean, it was definitely worth noting that you know he didn't just completely continue his domination against a lineup that, you know, he could, he could have dominated if he had his best stuff. Yeah. I, I felt like he was just fighting his release point. You know, he would groove in a 97 mile an hour fastball and then completely plant a splitter down in the dirt that bounced away from Garrett three yeah. times, as you mentioned. So, you know, those are, those are things that a guy that is still learning what it means to be a starter, still getting into that routine and Hey, you don't need to come out and necessarily throw all your best stuff in the first inning. You know, you got to kind of pace yourself, really get into a rhythm he, he just was never in a rhythm last night so I don't have major concerns in fact I'd almost rather him have this outing so that he can sit down and look at the tape work with Woody work with Chris Gordon and come back and say okay now I'm ready you know now this is what I did this is what I need to do a little differently so better this than maybe against a Texas Tech you know in a couple weekends so yeah no I definitely don't want to see that happen against um Texas Tech here in, in a few weeks um one guy that did not struggle last night on the mound, Charlie Hurley, man, yet again, he comes in five plus scoreless out of the bullpen. I mean, this is just, it's becoming a weekly thing. You know, it's, it's going to happen. It just keeps happening over and over. You know, he's been awesome. He's been the MVP of the pitching staff so far, just with the way that he has affected each and every game that he's come into. Um, this leads into a big picture conversation. You know, this isn't as much relevant to, this weekend series against new Orleans, but looking ahead to Texas tech, when Texas will have time to set up the pitching rotation, man, I mean, Zach, we've got five starters here. You know, if, if you include Charlie Hurley, so I'm talking about Lucas Gordon, Zane Morehouse, Travis Staley, LBJ, and then Charlie Hurley, you've got five starters that can really, you know, eat up some innings. They are stretched out a bit. I mean, just thinking about how they're going to want to mix and match those starters is a very, interesting topic because the three best pitchers of those three so far this year have been Lucas Gordon, LBJ, and Charlie Hurley. But Hurley has been so good out of the bullpen. And then we really, we know that the coaching staff and David Pierce liked what they saw from Zane Morehouse before the season. You know, they were talking about how he was pushing Lucas Gordon for the Friday night role. So he, they have faith in him and his potential. And then Staley, you just don't really know what you're going to get. And it'll be the same thing, whether he's in the bullpen or on a midweek or starting on Sundays. I mean, this really could go a lot of different directions. So I want to ask you, what would you do just based on what we've seen? And then also, what do you think will ultimately happen come Texas Tech? Yeah, I mean, if, if I'm Coach Pierce tomorrow, I'm, I'm throwing out Gordon on Friday night because you know what you're going to get. You're going to get a guy that's going to go five and six innings. He's going to eat it up. Um, he's going to give you a chance to compete. I would then roll out Zane Morehouse on Saturday with, you know, you know, he, he's going to come out and he has that experience of having been out there and then roll out LBJ on Sunday, knowing that you can turn that Sunday start into maybe a kind of a dual role with Travis Staley. Right. So if we know that Staley has been really, really good three to four innings, it's been the longer extension that's really kind of hurt him. And same thing with LBJ. So now you have a really good pairing that you can put in there of, two guys that have very different looks, right? The ball's coming out of their hands very differently. It's a different motion. Um, and then, you know, I would I would still leave Hurley, as much as I like him, I would still leave him as that savior out of the bullpen. He can come in and eat five innings if you need, because if one of your starters gets in trouble, like a Morehouse on a Saturday, you know, he's there. And so you really kind of start to buttress. It, it almost looks more like a, like a kind of an MLB type, type approach where, you know your starter may only go five innings and then you're just going to platoon all the way through. So that that's what I would do if I were coach Pierce. Um, I think likely what we're going to see is, is probably some variation thereof, but. Yeah, no. So we're, may, we're, we're mostly in agreement there. I am, I am less confident on what I think will actually happen. Um, yeah. the, the way I would personally do it, I, I would have it pretty similar to you. I would definitely go Lucas Gordon on Friday 
I would go LBJ on a Saturday than Zane Morehouse on Sunday because I don't know. I just always think it's better to have the better guy throw on Saturday than on Sunday because then you just know what you're dealing with going into Sunday because if LBJ happens to go out there and, you know, throw six or seven really good innings and you don't have to burn, you know, a Charlie Hurley or a Travis Staley, then, you know, going into Sunday to start with Zane Morehouse, you have the luxury of having a very short leash and you have Charlie Hurley available. And then same can be said, you know, it's just, it's, it's easier to plan um, in my opinion, if you have the guy with the higher upside go on Saturday, but I mean, it's a tough conversation, man, because Charlie Hurley has been awesome, but I would just be scared to touch him because he's been so good. Like, yeah, he's he's so valuable. You know, if Texas has a four to two lead in the fifth inning and you have this guy that just time and time again has come out of the bullpen and gone three or four scoreless innings. That is I mean, that's just possibly even more valuable than having him roll out there on a Sunday for, you know, the first five innings of the game and then having to hand it off to, you know, maybe a Travis Staley or just the typical bullpen guys. Um, later in a close game so I don't know it's it's gonna be interesting man I don't they could go a lot of different directions with this so it'll be interesting to see how it plays out another thing that I want to talk about is the lineup construction which David Pierce has had a lot of fun playing with over the last <laughs> couple of weeks um, the wrinkle we got on Tuesday night was Jaden Duplantier starting in left field moving Porter Brown to the DH slot having Jalen Flores on the bench that lineup felt pretty good on Tuesday night. I will say it made a lot of sense. The more I thought about it, we didn't, Jaden didn't really get any, you know, tough plays out there and left. So we didn't really get a look of what he might look like defensively, you know, on, on a tough play or just a ball in the gap and stuff like that. So it'll be interesting to see when he actually gets some more um, balls hit to him out there, but I liked what it did for the offensive line. What, what were your thoughts from that move? And then if we might see that more going forward. Yeah, I think, you know, Jaden Duplantier came in as, you know, that second baseman. Yep. But he's he's played in se- second base. He's played shortstop. He's played center field. He's played in left field. Uh, I think he looks the worst probably at shortstop. His, his arm motion is just not in footwork or not in sync for that. Um, so long term, I, I still think second base is his home. But as well as Jack Dowd's been hitting, you, you can't take him out of the lineup, right? At the same time, Jaden's now hitting 412 on the season with a 1000 OPS. So you have to start getting him at bats. And unfortunately, now you start looking at, well, do we take the bat and put it in the lineup or do you take the defensive and put it in the lineup? Um, He had one ball hit over his head in left field, which he he took a little bad read on. Um, But yeah, I mean, I I think I'm going to have to trust the coaches in terms of what they're seeing in practice. And then also in gameplay between him and Porter Brown, you really can't take Porter Brown's bat out of the lineup. So at that point, yeah, you do have to slide one of them into the DH and then play the other on the left field. Um, but, but I didn't, I actually like, you know, Garrett sitting in that, that three or four hole um, just because of the at bats he's taken. I still probably put DC down a little further just for now. Um, maybe you slide to Plantier up into the three hole and then have Garrett busters him. Um but yeah, I mean, overall, I think Jared Thomas looked really, really good last night at his at-bats. You know, he went 10 pitches deep at one point, just fouling him off. You know, he's starting to kind of show signs that he's not that freshman anymore, that he really is the has that plate presence. So yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of movement there because then also you have to take into the fact that, well, Garrett's not catching every day. You bring Galvan in and Garrett's been moved to the DH. Now you have to sit Porter Brown or Jaden Duplantier. So yeah, there's there's a lot of matchup headaches for David Pierce right now, for sure. Yeah, we're, we're still going to see more movement going forward. I mean, you mentioned it, you know, Texas has a game Wednesday night against North Dakota State. You know, I'm sure Galvan will be behind the plate, so we'll have a different looking lineup there. But I think the default lineup, um, I think this might be the way to go, just because Duplantier has been the better hitter of all the possible, you know, freshman guys you could stick in there between, like, you know, a Jalen Flores or, you know, like a Kate O'Hara, Max Ballou, stuff like that. I think Jaden has been the best at the plate. The numbers would indicate that he had some really good at-bats going to the opposite field, drawing some walks on Tuesday night. And then, yeah, I mean, in left field, I mean, this is like no disrespect to Porter Brown, but I mean, Jaden's not, he's not going to be worse than Porter Brown has been out there. So um, I don't really have concerns in that regard. It's probably going to be an upgrade defensively. 
it allows Porter to be the DH where he's really, um, you know, he's had a good year at the plate so far. So I like having him as a left-handed bat in the middle of the lineup. So I think that might, um, you know, be the, the go-to combination going forward. But I mean, these things change so quickly. So we will, we will have to wait and see. Only time will tell. Um, Zach, I want to quickly talk about the New Orleans Privateers coming into town, another powerhouse. Um, these guys are a lot better than the Manhattan Jaspers. Um, you know, everyone is, even the even the one in 15 North Dakota State Bison, you know, David Pierce said after the game that, man, that's the best one in 14 team I've ever seen. And, um, <laughs> you know, I mean, those guys were pretty good. I mean, they had some yeah. pitchers, they had good swings, you know, a lot of their they can losses. Hit. They can hit. A lot of, yeah. yeah. A lot of their losses have been by one or two runs. So that team was definitely better than the record reflects. But um, yeah, uh, go ahead and tell us a little bit about New Orleans, who will be rolling into town. The only thing I really know about these guys is, they were hitting or they were the guys on the mound during that horrible umpire call in the Southland conference from uh, last weekend. Yeah. So, you, you know, the privateers, they're, they're 11 and five on the season. They're, they're coming out of the Southland conference, um, which is, you know, McNeese state and a bunch of those, those familiar foes that Texas has played with, you know, over the years, like Lamar, Northwestern state, CeeLo, um, a and Corpus, but, uh, they're picked third in their conference. I think that's, you know, probably legitimate. You know, Texas A&M, Corpus, and McNeese have really kind of been the top two teams there. Um, they've, like as you mentioned, they've had a really interesting stretch. So they scored 75 runs over their past couple of games, uh, including a 35-3 to seven-inning drubbing of Mississippi Valley State, in which the now um, Southland Conference umpire was reprimanded, and he's no longer, like, umpiring the rest of the season or indefinitely, I guess. I don't know what the length is, but yeah, if you haven't seen those videos, go take a look. Even ESPN and the mainstream media was definitely getting in on the, the bashing of that umpire who took it a little personally. Um, but then they turned around and got drubbed by LSU, which, I mean, who's not going to do that this year? 16 to nothing on Tuesday night. So uh, it's a team that has talent. It's a team that hits for power. Uh, they're not really good on the base pass, so I don't expect Garrett to have a ton of work behind the plate in terms of throwing guys out but uh it's a premium on defense which is going to be really interesting because the privateers don't make a lot of errors they're actually like sixth or seventh in the country in fielding percentage texas has feasted on bad pitching and errors the, the over the six game win streak so something's got to give um but i mean texas does have an 11 to 1 advantage going back to since 1984 their last meeting was in 2018 when i think uno came for a weekend series at all as well at texas so um you know to date they've they've played a really soft schedule they got beat 12 nothing by southern miss they got beat 16 nothing by lsu um they did beat a good two lane or a decent two lane team so but everything else is like eh, they're they're okay they can hit the ball they're they're decent pitching but nothing crazy so, yeah, no, I mean, it'll be interesting. Um, their, their Friday, Saturday guys have been decent. Um, you know, Friday night guy, you will never guess it. Um, he throws with his left hand off the mound, um, Ty Tyler LeBlanc here. Um, and then they've got, they've got their senior righty, Brandon Mitchell on Saturday. Um, I haven't, I haven't watched any film of these guys, but their numbers are decent. They've been pretty solid for new Orleans. So, which means Texas is going to need to do a good job of just putting, you know, making those pitchers earn every single out early in the year. I would just, uh, you know, I'd be doing stuff on my laptop, watching the game and it'd be like, Oh, Texas three up three down, you know, in the blink of an eye, you know, that was an that was an easy inning for the pitcher, you know, and those innings have started to fade away a little bit more. Texas has done a better job of making the opponent pitcher actually work for the outs, you know, drive up that pitch count a little bit more, you know, work some seven pitch, eight pitch walks, yeah. extend some innings with two out hits. Um, and if Texas can get into the, to the privateers bullpen, I mean, good things are probably going to happen as you would guess. Um, the pitching status is not that deep. So I think having patient at bats extended, it, extending innings with two out hit with two out hits, that'll be important um, stuff like that. It'll, you know, we expect the rotation to be the same this weekend on the mound for Texas. You know, this, this will be a big chance for um, Zane Morehouse and Travis Staley to, go out there and show they can throw strikes. They can be efficient with their pitches. They can put away hitters when they get two strikes on a guy. So yeah. this will kind of be the last chance before conference play for one of those two guys to say, you know, I deserve to be a starter or at the very least just build some confidence going into Texas tech, regardless of what the role um, will ultimately be for those guys. 
Yeah. I mean, a couple of players to watch on their side is Tristan Mori. He's he's hitting 450 on the year. He's got four home runs. Tyler Bischke, he's hitting 418 with three home runs. So the thing that I noticed, they have quite a bit of power throughout their lineup, but the bottom of the lineup does strike out a lot. And so if Texas can really limit the damage that the top of the lineup can do, you know, those top four hitters, they, I think they have a really good chance to keep them in check. Um, the other interesting thing I saw was, you know, they've, they've used a lot of arms out of the bullpen. So there's four guys that all have at least one or two saves each. Um, so I think even if a, a starter gets into trouble for New Orleans, Texas is going to see a lot of arms this weekend. Yeah. Um, from the scouting reports, it sounds like they all have decent breaking balls. Um, so we're going to probably see a lot of off-speed stuff. Nothing overly powerful. I didn't see anyone that had, you know, 94 plus on the gun. So it's going to be, you know, Texas is going to have to be patient and look for their spots and not try to dive and, and kind of reach out to flip something. Um, and then I'm sure that this will be all over Longhorn Network, much like Brother Jasper in his seventh inning stretch. But uh, I found it interesting that the Sunday starter, Colin Horton, was actually a freshman when Melendez was a sophomore at Odessa Junior College. So little little connection there. Melendez is obviously no longer at Texas, but um, maybe they can uh, – Melendez can give the boys a – a scouting report on Horton. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure Ivan's uh, they, they've got him giving a zoom presentation yeah. on uh, Tyler <laughs> on Horton and his release points and how the ball comes out of his hand. Um, you know, what he likes to have for breakfast, um, how they can sabotage him in, in a medley of ways. So yeah. that is something that um, that that's a great observation there. You know, you got to do anything you can to win. So, you know, I mean, what's Ivan doing? He's just, he's just out there trying to, trying to make his way up through the Diamondbacks minor league system. He's got time to spare. Um, why not? He's got plenty of time. It's spring training. Come on. World baseball yeah. classics going on. No one's even paying attention. <laughs> no one's paying attention. All right, Zach. Um, let's make some picks here. I, I had a tough time with mine. What, what are you going with for this weekend, Texas against New Orleans? So, you know, I'm in a, and I'm, I'm in a prove it uh, stage right now. So I'm going to go two and one. two and one and people are probably losing their minds. Like, why would we lose to New Orleans? I, I just don't trust the team to completely come out and sweep a team that's not going to throw 17 balls in a row and just feast on a bunch of errors. If a team plays solid defense, I feel like they're going to stay in the game against Texas. So, and again, they have good hitters. They've got guys that can hit the ball well. And so um, I think they should probably sweep, but I'll go two and one just because I picked sweep last time and didn't get it. So. <laughs> Yeah, I've I've been pretty I've been pretty hot with my predictions lately, um, you know, for better or worse. I do not have to buy a brother Jasper custom made jersey. So I got that going for me. Texas did, in fact, sweet Manhattan. I really waffled on this one for a long time, man. I ended up going with the sweep because I like what I'm seeing at the plate, especially from a lot of the young guys like Jaden Duplantier, like Jared Thomas. The lineup feels deeper right now. I know people are probably sick of hearing us say it, but Dylan Campbell's been hitting the ball hard. He missed a home run by like a foot. He had a hard ground out. I really do not think he's that far away, even if the numbers indicate that he is. Um, man, Peyton Powell's hot as can be. Eric Kennedy's still hitting the ball well. I, I think I trust the offense enough. I trust the defense enough. Like, you know, now that, you know, Peyton Powell's established himself at third. You've got Jaden Duplantier out there and left from time to time. I feel pretty good when the ball is hit now. You know, I mean, still Mitch Daly, he has his moments here and there where I'm just like, I, I hold my breath a little bit, but he's made some good plays recently. So I am beginning to trust the defense just a little bit more. I, I don't think it's a great defense. I don't fully trust it, but I think, you know, the, you know, it's tough because Charlie Hurley definitely might not be available. He threw a lot of pitches on Tuesday night. We'll, we'll, you know, wouldn't expect to see LBJ unless it's like a bullpen situation on Sunday. Um, I don't know. I'm going to go three and oh, but I could definitely see two and one. I waffled for a while on this pick. Can't hear you for some reason. This team is still young. There's going to be moments where you're just like, what's going on? Um, and so they have looked defensively better at the plate or at the, in the, on the diamond, you know, Daly's made some really solid plays. Um, Jack's, I feel like he's ranging over better now. Um, and Peyton Powell at third base has not been a, a letdown at all. You know, he's no Skylar messenger. He's also had some really good moments. So yeah, I, 
again, I picked two and one. I, I honestly think they should go three, and zero, but hedging my bets. Yeah, no, I think it's fair. It'll definitely be, uh, I'm excited to see how that plays out. Um, man, it really snuck up on us. We've got some conference games in the big 12 so far. So I'll go ahead and uh, tee it up for you and let you talk about some of the big 12 games that we're going to see in action and just um, some other good series from around the country. Cause there is a, uh, there is conference baseball getting started this weekend, you know, even, even despite March madness and the world baseball classic, uh, you know, <laughs> D one baseball, there's no rest. This is a big weekend. That's right. Yeah. So um, pure craziness to start off the big 12 conference slate. You got number 12, Oklahoma state, number 22, Texas tech facing off on the plane. So they're in Lubbock. That's, you know, that very well could be the title decider weekend right off the yeah. bat. You know, they're, they've looked like the best two teams. They've been the most consistent teams. I think they're both 15 and three at this point. So it'll be really interesting to see because Oklahoma state's gotten hot. They were a little, little schizophrenic there at times. Texas tech has obviously been hot with the bats, but they're, their um, pitching has been better than expected probably. So that's going to be a massive series. Uh, another one in my mind is it's kind of that midfield or the next tier down, which is TCU playing at Oklahoma. Um, that could have massive repercussions just in terms of TCU trying to get an early, early jump on the big 12 standings and where they can kind of fit in because they've had a little, a little blip here and there recently, their defense have not been great. Their pitching has been a little iffy and they've had some guys injured. So That'll be interesting to watch. And then, um, you know, the Wildcats of K-State come down to Waco to play Baylor. Uh, Baylor did get a win on Tuesday night, so they're not, you know, losing every game. <laughs> they're, they're still a bad team. Let's, let's call it what it is. But they did beat Rice 6 nothing. So maybe they're figuring something out. Um, but, no, I, in, in all three series, I think I favor Texas Tech, TCU, and Kansas State um, for those. Uh, but then West Virginia is out in – uh, North Carolina, they're playing UNC Greensboro. And then Kansas is pulling the old Texas from 2022. They're playing three at the Citadel. And then they have Charleston uh, Southern as well, I think next week or midweek. So yeah, they're they're doing their South Carolina walkthrough. Yep. Throwback to last year, rule number one, never lose to a school that has the word the in the title. <laughs> um, so we'll see if Kansas um, follows rule number one this weekend. I mean, yeah, you hit the nail on the head there with um, – Oklahoma State and Texas Tech, I saw you jot that down. And my first thought was, man, that that is um, a pretty big mid-March series there because those have been the two best teams as far as um, preseason, yeah. just like eye test-wise. TCU, their, their upside is up there with those teams, but they haven't been as consistent. But uh, yeah, man, you've got that series at Texas Tech. I'm excited to see how the Texas Tech pitching um, steps up against a good against a good Oklahoma State lineup that um, – Definitely has a lot of boppers there with Rock Riggio, Nolan McClain, and all the rest of those guys. Um, yeah. That'll be a big one, especially with Tech coming to town next week. We'll see if they come in, you know, with a lot of momentum, which I'm worried uh, might end up being the case, or if they come in a little more desperate, having lost a home series to the Cowboys. So that'll be big. Uh, you also have some SEC series jotted down here. We've got Ole Miss, Vandy, LSU, a and I mean, Florida, Alabama, there is – yeah, big weekend for college baseball. Yeah, and then you got out west, you have Stanford, who just dropped a series to USC playing yeah. Oregon State, who lost to Washington State for the first time in, you know, a bazillion years. Um, apparently, the, you know, everyone can likes to talk about the Augie rant. You know, that's like, especially this, we're recording on Wednesday for frame of reference, but today Longhorn Network is, is running a, a big special on Augie and the passing of him. That's been five years. Uh, apparently Oregon State's head coach had a 35 minute fiery rant according to their catcher after their Sunday loss to to Washington State and I said yeah you know that's keeping of the times we got to keep that spirit and energy alive so no it, it, there's a lot of really good baseball out there Virginia's playing NC State um, and then kind of that mid-major Southern Miss is playing Texas State and Texas State beat TCU in Slam Marcus because they continue to hit home runs like crazy people uh, on Tuesday night. So yeah, the, I'm going to be glued to the TV all weekend long. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it is a bad week to be a television man. I will say that for sure. I am, <laughs> you know, we'll be at the dish, um, but I will be locked in on March madness. That's for sure. And uh, I'll be locked in on these conference baseball games, man. It is just going to be, it is going to be a big weekend of ball all around the country. Um, I'm excited to see how it all plays out 
you have anything else that you want to share with the fine folks of YouTube before we get out of here? I was just going to ask you, you know, how, how do you predict Texas's first round going? How, you know, we're playing the toothpaste team and maybe there's a, a very spicy second round matchup potential. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, Colgate, you know, they, they shoot a lot of threes, check out Keenan stuff on the website, but you know, whenever you're thinking of a 15 seed, you know, I, I would prefer not to play one that leads the country and, you know, three pointers, but I think at the end of the day, I obviously trust Texas to take care of, of the toothpaste factory there. And then, uh, yeah, we'll see if A&M is able to get past Penn state. Um, if they do, I, uh, it's going to be a stressful Saturday, man. It is, <laughs> it will be a stressful Saturday. If we get that matchup between Texas and A&M, I, I trust Texas to win. I really like the guard play this time of year. And um, the big guys have been playing better lately with just Sue and Bishop. So I feel good, but man, I, I will be nervous. I, I can promise you that. And uh, yeah, man, it's going to be a fun, nervous weekend. Um, check out that cheer on the basketball team, cheer on the baseball team. Um, check out all the stuff on Orange Bloods on all the sports. There will be a lot of it. Uh, go ahead and give us a like here on this video. Subscribe to the channel. Follow us on Twitter. You guys know the drill at Aaron Little OB at Zach at the Dish. Um, yeah, man. I hope everyone has a good week, a good weekend, a good weekend of watching sports. And uh, with that, I'm, I say we get out of here. Let's get out of here. Have a good one and hook them.